I'd like to welcome everyone to Now Street's premier Women Transforming Our Financial Market Symposium. It's really great to be here, and I'm so glad you all are here to share this event with us today. This event is kind of somewhat of um, what would happen when Wall Street and a slumber party unite. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really, but truth is, it really is an important event, and it really means a lot to me that you're all here to share in this important mission to fix our financial market so that we could restore economic prosperity and keep the American dream alive for our children and for our grandchildren. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dara Albright. I'm the founder of Now Street. And Now Street symbolizes the Wall Street of tomorrow and the hope for a more prosperous economic future. So I've been hosting these events for quite a while now. And I'm still amazed by how much bigger and better each one gets. And this one has truly exceeded all of my expectations. I am so overwhelmed by the tremendous outpouring of support, and I really appreciate it. For years, I had wanted to host an event that was focused on empowering women in business and finance. And the timing just never seemed to be right until today. Because today, the US regulatory landscape, its capital markets, and the innovation and leadership that drives those markets are simultaneously on the threshold of extraordinary change. And this unprecedented combination is opening up so many new doors for women. And I never could have envisioned at all that this event would be able to attract such renowned speakers. And we have some women here who have literally paved the way for someone like me to even be able to have the opportunity to host an event like this. And I really appreciate you going out there and raising these glass ceilings for future generations. You guys are really true role models. So I, what I'd like to do is start by thanking our renowned speakers. I am so honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to the visionaries and the pioneers who are transforming our financial markets and paving the way for a new social economy. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. You guys provide the resources that make these events possible. And also for the amazing work that you do for small businesses and issuers that help them really be able to prosper. And I'd especially like to thank Lori Hoberman of Chad Bourne and Park for providing us this beautiful office space and for the amazing work that she has done through the course of her career in helping women in business. So if you see your logo up here, if you guys could just stand up for a second, um, because what I want to do is give the attendees a chance to kind of know who you are. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, see is, I see Rich is here from Cone Resnick, and Cone, what's that? Yeah, okay. So Rich, if you want to stand up for a second, you know, we really appreciate the work that you guys do, um, you know, providing expert tax advice and, and financial consultancy, especially to this new generation of private company issuers and investors. Um, and do we have Greg here from Ambrose? Anyone from Ambrose? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, those guys later as well as Jim. Uh, 85 Broads, you guys here? Okay, thank you, thank you ladies. I don't know, do, do you have, for those of you who don't know about 85 Broads, it's an incredible network of women, about 30,000 women um, in, in business and finance, entrepreneurs, you know, power players, and if you don't know the organization, you should really get to know it because they do absolutely wonderful things and hold a lot of events just like this for bringing women in the, in, in the workplace together. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Chris Camillo. Is, I saw Chris, okay. Chris, you want to come up for a second? I, Chris um, is the author of a book called Laughing at Wall Street and the title alone I absolutely love. Um, and Chris it has an incredible success story, has made tremendous success in investing, um, and uh, wrote the book, Laughing at Wall Street, and is actually dedicating this year of his life to, to following around a bunch of us crowdfunding loons uh, to do a documentary on crowdfunding. So maybe you want to just say a little bit about uh, Yes, the name of the documentary is Crowded Angels, and, and Dara is one of our stars. We're out here today. 
uh, seeking out interesting interviews of both entrepreneurs and uh, female investors and anyone that has an interesting perspective on the crowdfunding movement. If you plan to crowdfund uh, your next business or you're involved with the movement in any way and have something interesting to say, we'd love to spend five or ten minutes with you at some point today uh, interviewing you on tape for the film. Um, unfortunately, American Airlines lost half our equipment, so my partner is out trying to find to get a tripod right now at a rental place. But we will be probably outside here for most of the day if you want to stop by and say hi. Um, also, if you want to follow the film, uh, which will hopefully be out uh, at the end of 2013, just go to Facebook, and it's Facebook uh, forward slash uh, Crowd of Angels. Uh, we'd love to have you please like uh, our page and, and uh, keep up with the progress of the film. Happy to be here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much. So now, for those of you who are attending one of Now Street events for the first time, um, what we typically do is dedicate our events to a person or persons who have inspired us. Um, so we've dedicated to like Steve Jobs and the crazy people, you know, the ones crazy enough to, ch to think they could change the world or the ones that very often do. We've dedicated events to, you know, the, the legislators who actually passed the Jobs Act, overcame partisanship to come together to pass this, this great piece of legislation. Um, you know, we've dedicated events to the naysayers, you know, the people who say that crowdfunding won't make an impact. And for, you know, we love to, to dedicate events to those people because we love to prove them wrong. But nothing gives me more pleasure than to dedicate this one to my grandma Annie. <laughs> so although she never invented uh, or funded a world-changing product, she exuded intelligence and independence during an era when most women remained subservient. And she would be so proud to be here today. And, oh, sorry, um, if you think I get upset talking about my grandmother, just wait till I start talking about how dysfunctional our markets are. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to our dysfunctional markets. <laughs> So basically, our markets, unfortunately, are completely broken. And especially for the ladies in the room, I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. It's actually up to us to fix it, because we need to fix what the men had damaged. <laughs> so what it all boils down to, as my friend Lisa Thompson, who is one of the first internet analysts on Wall Street sitting in the front room today, we work together at Unterberg Tobin, she had told me, you know what? Men gamble, women shop. And that is really the fundamental difference between men and women. Women look beyond trading volumes, flashing ticker symbols. You know, we look beyond even balance sheets and cash flows. And because we represent the majority of, of consumers, we have the, you know, we, we basically see the products that keep our family safe happy, healthy. We know what our, our husband is, you know, is using. We know what our children like, the cereals they eat, the toys they want. You know, we're at the helm of all of this consumer information. And, you know, and I, what I really think that Wall Street lacks this insight as well as the emotion that women bring to the investing process. What Wall Street needs, they need enthusiastic investors, not detached traders. Now, men, on the other hand, men like to play games. Men transform Wall Street into this electronic playground for high-frequency traders. And Wall Street should not be one giant video game. Guys, you, there just comes a time in your life you've got to give up the video games. You know, put the Wii and the Atari away. <laughs> so what basically has happened is that we've allowed really non-committal flippers and a handful of supersized banking conglomerates to run amok with our financial markets. So instead of capital flowing to and from the entrepreneur, the innovator, uh, the job creator, it, it, to the American investor, the average American investor, it simply flows to and from mega cap stock to mega cap bank to mega cap, you know, to mega institution. And in an environment like this, how can our small businesses possibly access the capital that they need to grow? And the answer is, they just can't. They're not getting capital anymore from the banks. 
They're not getting it from the, the public stock exchanges anymore. You know, NASDAQ is, is not this great embracer of innovation as they once were. Um, you know, the OTC markets have become a joke. And, you know, good luck trying to get money, you know, for your business from, you know, Reed Hoffman or Warren Buffett. You know, basically, companies, with companies not going public today until they are mega cap, and with interest rates pretty much dwindling down to zero, you know, conventional, also conventional cla asset classes are no longer viable investment options either. So this is what has happened. You know, we, we basically have this harsh reality where, you know, the, these, you know, entrepreneurs and our innovators can't get capital. And at the same time, we're, we have, you know, an entire investing public of American workers that, that can't get the returns. You know, how are today's American workers supposed to grow their retirement portfolios when, you know, they can't even beat inflation? And the fact is they just can't. We have these, you know, we, we have on one side, we have these yield-starved investors, and on the other side, we have these, you know, hungry entrepreneurs, and then we have these stupid rules that basically say, we don't think you guys should ever meet. And it just doesn't make sense. So basically, you know, here's a solution. The solution, and leave it to a woman to come up with a solution in like literally five minutes, but <laughs> here's a solution. How about we just let those Americans that are looking for growth invest in the, the companies and the visionaries that are actually willing to provide it. I don't know, let's just let them meet. Because when you don't, you get IPO debolicals like Facebook. You don't have to look much further than Facebook's IPO to see the dysfunction and injustice in the capital markets. This was the most sought after investment of the century, one of America's biggest and greatest success stories. And yeah, you know what? Most of them, the American public did not have a chance to, to own Facebook during its dramatic climb. In fact, not even its users had the chance to invest in Facebook during its dramatic climb. So I just will never understand these logic behind these laws that basically permit you know, that, that basically permit, that, that basically only allow average citizens to invest in stocks only when their wealthiest citizens are ready to dump them. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. It's what happens when you have a government that basically tells you, tells the 99% that you're too dumb and stupid to be investing in private growth companies. You should be investing in the larger, safer companies, you know, like Enron. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that wasn't always the case, right? I mean, Facebook, when Facebook, whereas 100% of Facebook's growth was realized in the private market, 99% of Microsoft growth was realized after its IPO. And this is, do you remember how the economy flourished during these times when everybody had the opportunity to access growth? Look at all of these companies. They returned on average over 44,000% to the investing public. So it's this system that really permits only one segment of the population with the opportunity to build and create wealth and then restricts the majority, the rest of the population from accessing it. This is what's causing not only economic stagnation, but this enormous wealth divide that just keeps getting bigger. Now, this right here, this whole, you know, this flawed market structure, that's the real crux of the problem. It's not tax structure. You know, you could tax the 1% 100% and you could tax the 99% 0% and you will still have this great wealth divide. And the reason is because it's not, we have to fix the problem. The problem is flawed market structure. So our leaders need to stop playing political roulette with our children's future and they need to stop using tax structure as a political pawn. They need to come together and they need to fix the damn problem, the real problem, flawed market structure. Because if they don't, we are going to be facing a retirement of unimaginable proportions. Let's face it, today's American worker, they are paying into a social security system that is not going to be around when most people retire. And if they don't have the opportunity to access growth in their portfolios, you know, what is going to happen 20 years down the line? So thankfully, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, Jobs Act. This is an enormous start, and I commend our legislators who came together, put people before party to pass this amazing piece of legislation. 
But the truth is, this is the most historic, the ec most economic restorative piece of legislation in recent history, and yet no one really knows about it. No one outside, you know, the financial trades. And, you know, you don't really hear about it on MSNBC. You don't hear about it on Fox News. None of the pundits are talking about the Jobs Act. You want to know why? It's not divisive enough. It is utterly shameful that the policies that divide us get so much more attention than the legislation that actually unites us. This is the legislation that is going to transform Wall Street and it's gonna give smaller issuers and smaller investors the same opportunities to create wealth as the larger ones. And this is the marketplace that's gonna make it all happen. This private company marketplace, this is the NASDAQ of yesteryear. And why is that? Because this is where all the growth lives today. There's plenty of growth opportunities around, we all know that. They're just not on NASDAQ or they're not in the public markets at all, really, for that matter. So all the growth, the growth, this is where the growth lives today because this is where all the innovation lives today. And, you know, this is the marketplace that's fueling the next bull market, much like NASDAQ did in the 1990s. And the reason why none of this is really anything new or earth shattering, you know, look at, look at history, okay? Throughout history, it's been innovation, particularly in mass communications, that's been the impetus for stock market growth and economic um, expansion. So look in 1920, this little machine called the radio came out and, and you know, inspired this great bull market of the 1920s. And why the Dow exploded, why was that? Because the radio was the innovation of the day and that's where um, the, all the radio stocks and the innovation of the day lived on the Dow. Same thing happened when television jumped on the scene in 1947 and inspired the, the longest bull market in our history, 47 to 57. And of course, we all remember what Internet 1.0 did uh, in the 1990s for NASDAQ. And why that happened on NASDAQ? Because that's where all the innovation lived in the 90s. It was on the NASDAQ exchange. You know, NASDAQ became the most powerful stock market in the world because it took over the role of incubating our most innovative young companies. So what do radio, television, and Internet all have in common? They all changed the way uh, they, they all change the world by creating a more dynamic way of reaching the consumer. Because that's really what it's all about, getting the consumers to buy stuff. And when consumers are buying stuff, the economy is moving. So these inventions, all of these also had something else in common. They had supportive capital market structure that helped our money, help you know, average American investors have, have their capital reach that innovation. So everybody was able to prosper. Now, what's happening today is that we are in this period of new innovation, and I will tell you that this social and mobile revolution is more powerful than all of these other inventions in history combined. And could you imagine the prosperity that could ensue if we would just allow our people's capital to reach this innovation? You know, here is how powerful social media is. It took 38 years for radio to reach 50 million users. It took Cityville less than three weeks. Not bad considering it took man over four million years just to develop the written language. Women would have done it in less than three. <laughs> Technology and communications is snowballing. The internet will transform society and the economy for hundreds of years to come. This is the most disruptive technology in the history of the world. Every two days, there is more information being created than between the dawn of civilization and 2003. This is interesting. The amount of global digital information created and shared from documents, pictures, to tweets grew nine times in five years to nearly two zettabytes. I included this slide for two reasons. One, I just wanted to say the word zettabyte because I just thought that was kind of cool. And two, I got this information from Mary Meeker's end of the year report. And if you guys have not seen that, that is a must download on the internet. And not only is social media changing the way consumers consume, but it's changing the way we invest. When was the last time anyone in this room called their broker to buy or sell a stock? And I have another question, does anyone even buy or sell stocks anymore? I mean, don't machines just do that? 
So, the, you know, investing now is about to become more social. Gone are the days of being detached from our investments, and we're moving towards this new era where investing and social consciousness finally converge. Ordinary Americans are going to be able to own pieces of their community. We're going to be able to lend money to small businesses. We're, we're going to be able to borrow from our peers. You know, we, we're, you know, we're not going to need to go to banks anymore. Wall Street is about to become less and less significant. And this democratization of Wall Street, it, this is not even anything new. You know, this, this is something that's really been slowly building for quite a while now. Actually, you know, even if you go back, you know, two decades ago, you know, look what happened in the early 1990s with, with direct registration making it easier, um, or making it possible for issuers and, and for investors to communicate directly. You know, we saw this when, when this uh, little beer company, Wit Beer, did its first IPO on the internet. When Google chose to actually do their IPO through the Dutch auction process and make it fairer for everybody to own a piece of, piece of Google. You know, when, when we also, when investors started buying stock in private companies on exchanges like SharesPost and Gate and Second Market, and now today we have crowdfunding. You know, this to me is why I'm so passionate about crowdfunding. You know, and there are a lot of naysayers out there, and I think that there are a lot of people out there that are fearful of this or they just don't get it. But the truth is, America was built on the very same principles that govern crowdfunding. You know, it, it's, it's, it's simple. It's giving equal opportunity to all citizens to build wealth. That's what America is. That's what crowdfunding is. You know, and that's why we're here today. So investing is about to become a lot more meaningful. You know, with crowdfunding, people are going to go back to investing in businesses, not trading ticker symbols. We're going to be investing in, in a company because we like the product, we use the product, we believe in the, in the CEO's vision, vision or mission, or, you know, we're investing because we believe that this company is going to make an enormous impact on society. And women are going to continue to play a more integral role in the nation's economy. You know, I, I found this out. Is Mackenzie here? Where's Mac there she is. Um, Beauty, Beauty in the Bull magazine. And do you have copies out here, by the way? No. Oh, okay. So uh, you'll, you'll meet Mackenzie after. But I saw this this morning, some really interesting facts. Um, okay, spending power of nearly 20 trillion. Women, w women, okay, Women now have t represent nearly twenty trillion dollars in spending power. They are key decision makers. Um, that's expected. They control fourteen trillion in personal wealth, and by twenty twenty, that's supposed to go to twenty two million. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. We are, you know, making a pretty powerful impact. So I realize that today the headlines look pretty grim. But don't believe everything that you read, and especially not in the New York Times, because these are not even today's headlines. In fact, all of these headlines came from the New York Times in 1994, right before the greatest economic expansion in our history. And you know what? The stars are way more aligned than they were in 94. We have this historic re regulation that's opening up new opportunities for smaller issuers and investors. We're, we're wa watching the rise of an untarnished private company marketplace. We're seeing the proliferation of social media. And most importantly, women are rising and creating new investing culture that fosters economic growth as well as social consciousness. And all of these factors are going to have a profound impact not only on Wall Street but on Main Street as well. The future is not bleak. It is full of enormous promise. So, that's my presentation. I'm not going to get all hell and ready on you and start singing, you know, <laughs> I'm woman. Um, so, but I will end by saying, ladies, let's go show them how it's done. You're here. <laughs>